All right, good morning or good afternoon or whenever you're watching this. I'm glad you're joining uh, us here on this video. My name is John Whitaker, as Andrew said, and uh, I am a friend of Josh, Andrew, Jake, and a, a member, a partner here at Hill City Church. And uh, if you are eager to grow in your faith and to understand the Bible, I've got a bunch of resources on my website where uh, that can help you really understand the Bible, grow in your faith, and experience the Bible as a source of life. You can find that at johnwhitaker.net. And in today's message, we're going to be looking at really the final main judge in the book of Judges. It is the last sermon in this series on the Judges. And I got to be honest, I got a phone call from Josh a few weeks ago asking me if I would preach this message. And so Josh calls me up, he's talking to me, and he says, so I, I really am wondering if you could preach on December 20th. Well, that was when we were expecting to be live. Now we're back online. And so he asked me to preach this message, and he says, we're going to be going through the book of Judges, and that week will be on Samson. And my reaction is like, Josh, do you realize that's December 20th? That's the Sunday before Christmas. It's the Sunday before Christmas, and you're asking me to preach on Samson? Like, really? Um, and so in the spirit of Christmas, just to keep us connected to Christmas, uh, I offer this to you in the spirit of the night before Christmas. "'Twas the Sunday before Christmas, and all through the land the Philistines were ruling with a heavy, heavy hand. But God was still faithful, though the people did wrong. He raised up a deliverer who was really, really strong. A Nazarite he'd be all the days of his life, no alcohol or dead things or cutting his hair with a knife. His vow was the secret to his mighty strength, represented by his hair of incredible length. Samson's his name, and a Nazarite he was. He defeated the Philistines until they gave him a buzz. Why did this happen? How can this be? Read Samson's story, and I think you will see he was afflicted by a weakness that often plagues you and me. And the reality is, Samson's one of those judges that we tend to think about more often than others. We actually know Samson's story more than probably any of the other main judges in the book of Judges because Samson's exploits are so incredible. But the result of being fascinated by Samson's great exploits is we miss the point of the story. And so what I want to do today in this message is I want to simply walk down through the Samson story, tell some of those great exploits, but help us to see what the author of Judges wants us to see in the Samson story. And in order to set that up, we need to make sure we have the context of the Samson story. Let's start with the context in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, Samson is in a very real sense. He's the last main judge in the book. And in that cycle of judges from um, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord to oppression to crying out to the Lord to God raising up a deliverer, we've been spiraling downward. When we get to Samson, in a very real sense, we get to sort of the bottom of the spiral. Samson is this, this judge who, in spite of his fascinating tales and his great exploits, he is a tragic story in the book of Judges. And so we've reached the bottom of the spiral of the main judges. Um, and not only that, Samson is... He is actually raised up intentionally by God. You can read his birth story in Judges chapter 13, and he's raised up to deliver God's people from their oppressor. And at this point in time, the oppressor is the Philistines. And the Philistines have been ruling over Israel for a number of decades. And God now raises up Samson through a miraculous birth. And you can read it in Judges chapter 13, how God appeared to his mom and then his mom and dad and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a son and he's going to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Well, when God shows up and announces that he's going to give them this son and that this, this little boy is going to be the deliverer, God also tells his mom and dad something that's very, very important, and that's this, that Samson is supposed to be a Nazarite from the day of his birth. Not a, not a like, 
Nazarite in the sense of from Nazareth, like Jesus, but a Nazarite in the sense of the Nazarite vow. And you can read about the Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6, but essentially there are three main parts to the Nazarite vow. You heard it in uh, the little reading I did here just a second ago. There are three parts. The first is you got to stay away from grapes, wine, or any alcoholic drink like beer, right? So stay away from grapes, wine, and beer. The second one is don't touch anything dead. Nothing dead you can touch, no corpse, no part of a corpse, don't touch anything dead. And the third part of the vow is don't ever cut your hair. Now most of the time, a Nazarite vow was a voluntary vow taken for a few weeks, a couple months, or whatever. But for Samson, it was a vow for his whole life. From the day of his birth, he was going to be a Nazarite. And these three factors were going to govern his life. And that is incredibly important as you listen to his story. And the other thing we need to know to set up the Samson story well is kind of the geography, where this happens. And so the author of Judges tells us that the Samson story takes place in what's called the Sorek Valley. So if you look at this map, you can see where the Sorek Valley is at. It's just a little bit northwest of Jerusalem, and it's a small little strip of land through the rolling hills in central Israel. Samson grows up in the town of Zora at the northeastern edge of the valley, and most of the action, or at least the catalyst for the action in the early chapters of the Samson story, um, come out of a town called Timnah, which is a Philistine city at the western edge of the Sorek Valley. And th those two cities really illustrate how the Sorek Valley functioned in Israel. The Sorek Valley is in what's called the Shephelah. The Shephelah are a series of rolling hills right through the middle of Israel. Um, they are sort of like a buffer zone between the coastal plains to the west and the central highlands, which is the heart of the country, in the middle of the country. Jerusalem sits in the central highlands. And so Samson grows up in this buffer zone between the Philistines in the coastal plains and Jerusalem and the heartland of Israel in the, in the central highlands. He grows up in this rolling hill country in this little valley uh, that is really a gateway between the central highlands and the Philistine territory on the plains. That's where the action takes place. And as Samson grows in strength, chapter 13 sets us up for the Samson story by ending by saying, as Samson grew, the spirit of the Lord began to move him. And our expectation and assumption would be at this point, all right, we're ready to see how he's going to deliver Israel from the Philistines. It's just that that's not what happens. As you turn into chapter 14, there's no great war where he goes out and conquers the Philistine. What happens instead is this. Samson leaves his hometown, walks down through the Sorek Valley to that Philistine city of Timnah. For some reason, he takes this trip. And as he arrives in the valley, he, or in Timnah, he sees a woman there in Timnah, and she is gorgeous. She is uh, beautiful. She captivates Samson's eyes. He can't take his eyes off of her, and he, he wants her. He wants to marry her. And in these, uh, this day and age, right, marriages were arranged, and so uh, Samson goes back home to mom and dad and, and says, I saw a woman in Timnah, and I want to marry her. And this is what literally it says, for she is right in my eyes. For she is right in my eyes. And his mom and dad are like, no, Samson, you can't marry her. She's a Philistine. You need to marry someone from your own city, from your own people. Um, and so they beg and they plead. And Samson's like, no, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Well, Samson prevails, so mom and dad give in. And so they decide, okay, we'll, we'll head back down to Timnah and we'll make the arrangements for the marriage. And so mom, dad, and Samson uh, take the five or six mile little walk through the valley down to Timnah. Somewhere along the way, Samson and his mom and dad appear to get separated, or at least Samson turns off on a little side route as they approach the, the city of Timnah. Here's what's important to note. Samson takes this little side route, and it says he goes into the vineyards of Timnah. What are vineyards? Well, vineyards are a place where grapes grow. Usually in this culture, they grow them for wine, and Samson's a Nazarite. He's supposed to avoid grapes, wine, and other strong drink. 
But nevertheless, he flirts with grapes and he goes into the vineyard. Well, while he's in the vineyard, uh, a young lion begins to kind of approach Samson growling and roaring as he comes towards Samson. And all of a sudden, Samson feels his, the strength uh, of the spirit rush upon him. And Samson takes that lion and it says he, he kills the lion and rips him in half like you rip a young goat. Now, I've never ripped a young goat in half myself, but apparently that was a thing. I don't know. He rips this lion in half like you rip a young goat in half, it says. And Samson then rejoins his mom and dad on the main road to Timnah, and he doesn't tell them what he did. And he didn't tell them, my guess is, is because he knew. He knew he shouldn't have been in the vineyard. He knew he shouldn't have touched a dead thing like a lion. Uh, he knew he was compromising his vow and he was flirting with disaster. So he just kept that secret to himself. And he and mom and dad finished the trip into Timna. They talk to the, the woman's parents. They make the arrangements for the wedding. Uh, they return back home and they prepare for the big day. And after a couple weeks or however long it was, the big day is here. It's time to now head down to Timna for the wedding. And so mom Dad and Samson uh, head to Timnah for the wedding. Well, on the way to Timnah, Samson decides to take a little detour and go back into those vineyards where he killed the lion and uh, see, see kind of, ah, oh, yeah, relive that great moment of his strength where he killed that lion. So he goes into the vineyard. He finds the carcass of the lion. And in the carcass of the lion, there's some honey that is now been... Uh, you know, a bee's hive and honey inside the lion. And Samson's like, ah, score. And so he reaches down. He takes a little bit of honey on his finger, licks some honey. It's like, ah, that is some good stuff. He actually takes a little bit of the honeycomb, takes some honey to mom and dad, doesn't tell them where he got the honey. Why? Because he's in the vineyard again. And now he just got honey out of what? The carcass of a lion. He's not supposed to touch dead things, but we won't tell mom and dad that. So he gets a little honey, gives some to mom and dad, and then they finish the trip to Timnah, and uh, they get ready for the wedding. The wedding um, goes off without a hitch, right? They show up in town. Uh, the townsfolk are like, oh, we're so glad you're here. They give Samson 30 uh, companions since he's a, a foreigner to town so that they can be like his groomsmen and friends for the wedding. And um, the wedding goes off without a hitch, and Samson uh, and his bride and the townsfolk begin to celebrate the seven-day-long wedding feast. It's actually described in the text as a drinking bout. And again, here's Samson in town with a bunch of Philistines at a drinking party, and he's a Nazarite, and he's supposed to avoid what? Alcohol, strong drink, wine, and the wine's flowing freely. Whether he had some or not, we don't know, but he's there, and he's around it. And, and so at the beginning of this wedding feast, Samson decides, ah, oh, I would like to have a little bit of fun with my 30 companions. And so he offers his 30 companions a riddle to see if they can find out the riddle. He says, look, I'm going to tell you a riddle. If you figure it out, I'll have to give each of you a new set of clothes. If you don't figure it out, each of you get to give me a new set of clothes. Sound like a deal? They're like, sweet. And so Samson gives him his riddle. And his riddle is, out of the eater came something sweet. Out of the strong, something to eat. And so the 30 men are like, what in the world? Sweet, strong, eat. What is he talking about? And for three days, they're trying to figure it out. They can't figure it out. And so after three days, they're like, we're going to look like idiots if we don't figure this out by the end of this wedding feast. And they don't want to look like idiots since he's a foreigner. And so they actually go to Samson's new wife and they, they say to her, you've got to do something. You've got to coax him. You've got to entice him. You've got to do something to figure out the answer to the riddle so that this foreigner doesn't make us look like fools. And so she begins to use her feminine wiles and apply that to Samson. And uh, as she she you know, works on Samson, and Samson's like, woman, look, I haven't even told mom and dad. Why would I tell you? And she's like, because I'm your wife. And she keeps trying, and she cries, and she, you know, she does everything she can. And on day seven, last day, she has just beat Samson down with her tears and her begging and her nagging. And finally, on day seven, Samson says, all right already. The answer is this. The, the strong is a lion and the, the something sweet is honey. I got some honey out of a lion on my way to the wedding. And, and 
and so Samson's wife all of a sudden goes and tells the, the 30 companions, here's the answer. It's a lion and it's honey. And so the 30 men come to Samson. We figured out your riddle. And they told him, uh, you know, that it's a lion and it's honey. And Samson is like, oh, he's exasperated. And he actually says to the 30 men, well, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have found out my riddle. And, you know, that's, that's, that's an insult in any culture to call your wife a heifer. But Samson didn't care. He's cocky and he's brave and he's loud and he's proud and, and now he's angry and angry that he, 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 he gave in to his wife. He's angry that they found out his riddle and now he's got to live up to his end of the bargain and, and give each of them a new set of clothes. And so in his anger, Samson goes 25 miles away to one of the major Philistine cities, the city of Ashkelon. And Samson arrives in Ashkelon, and he kills 30 Philistine men in the city of Ashkelon. He takes their clothes. He brings them all the way back to 25 miles to Timnah. He dumps them at the 30 men's feet and says, here, here's your new clothes. And he's just burning with anger, and he storms off and goes back to his hometown of Zorah and leaves his newfound wife behind. Um, Well, her dad is just... Sure, that Samson hates her so much that he, he decides, you know what? Samson doesn't want her for a wife. I, I need to do something. So he takes his daughter and he gives him to Samson's best man. You, you, can, you can have her for your wife. And so Samson's best man marries Samson's ex-wife. And Samson doesn't know any of this has gone on. Well, sometime later, we're not told how long, we're just told it's during the wheat harvest, Samson realizes, oh man, I should really actually go check on my my wife down in Timnah, and I'll bring her a goat. I'll bring her a goat. That's what I'll do. And so Samson gets a goat. He takes the five or six mile journey down uh, to Timnah, and he arrives, and he knocks on the door of his wife's house, and his uh, father-in-law opens the door, and Samson has no idea what's happened. And Samson's like, hey, I'm here to see my wife, and I brought her a goat. Can I go to her room? And uh, Samson's father-in-law says, uh, you were so angry, and you hated her so much. I assumed you didn't want to be your wife anymore, so I actually gave her to your best man. Uh, but here's your younger sister. Do you want her? And Samson's like, I don't want her. And Samson's angry, uh, just full of anger towards uh, his father-in-law and towards the Philistines and what's gone on. And so in his anger, Samson's like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him know how angry I am. I'm going to get back at the Philistines. And so the text says Samson goes. He, he catches usually translated foxes. But the word also means jackals. I'm guessing it's jackals because they're in packs. Samson catches 300 jackals, and he gathers them all up. He gets torches for the jackals, and he ties the, the jackals' tails together with a torch in between them, and then he lights all the torches on fire, and then he shoes the jackals through the wheat fields and the barley fields of the Philistines. Not only that, he burns the grain that's already been harvested and is standing already harvested, and he burns their olive groves. In other words, he burns all their crops, their winter crops, their summer crops, all their crops destroyed. And in a a farming community like ancient Timnah would have been, this just levels the village. I mean, they have nothing to eat now. He's just destroyed the economy and the food sources of the village by sending these jackals through to burn everything down and then burning their olive groves as well. Well, the Philistines are just aghast, and they're like, who did this? Who did this and destroyed our city? Uh, And word gets back to him, it was Samson. Samson did it because his former father-in-law gave his ex-wife to his best man. And so the Philistines are like, you got to be kidding me. That's what happened. And so the Philistines actually then go and burn Samson's former father-in-law and ex-wife alive, burn him to death and kill them. Well, now Samson's doubly angry and he's even madder. And so in his rage, he's like... uh, I will be completely innocent this time when I do harm to the Philistines. And he just goes on an indiscriminate killing spree, and he kills a number of the Philistines. And after killing a bunch of the Philistines, then he flees from Timnah up, it says, to the Rock of Etom, which is a cave area about 
oh, a handful of miles south of Jerusalem in the central highlands, about 18 miles or so away from Timna. So Samson flees up there, goes and hides from the Philistines. Well, the Philistines, they, they put together a massive search party and a massive posse, and they chase, uh, they chase Samson all the way to the rock of Etam and to the village outlying it, and they assault that village, the village of Lehi, and and the people of the village are like, why are you attacking us? And they tell them, because Samson came this way. Well, now the Jews living in Lehi, who, uh, you know, are like, they're, they're under the oppression of these very Philistine people, right? And they're like, we can't have war in our area. And so they actually put together 3,000 people who walk out to uh, where Samson's hiding. They call out to Samson. Samson comes out. And, and they say to him, what have you done? Now the Philistines are here in our own land and they want to make war with us. And Samson's like, just promise you won't kill me. You can hand me over to them. And so they tie up Samson with some ropes um, and they're going to hand Samson over to uh, the Philistines. And so uh, Samson begins to walk out towards the Philistines. And as the, the Philistines see Samson, they rush upon him. And all of a sudden, the strength pours into Samson's body. He snaps the ropes, and he needs some sort of weapon to fight the Philistines. There is a dead donkey, freshly killed donkey, right in the area. And so he reaches down, he grabs the jawbone of that donkey, and Samson just goes to war on the Philistines. And it says he killed a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone. But what's a donkey's jawbone? It's part of a carcass. It's a dead thing. But never mind that. Never mind that Samson once again just compromised his vow and went against his calling. He killed a thousand Philistines. And so uh, at this point, Samson seems like he's, he's doing what he's supposed to do. And Samson has some sort of faith in God. In fact, in that very moment, after killing those Philistines, Samson is worn out, he's tired, and he prays. And it's the first time in the Samson story we actually see Samson pray and acknowledge God. And he says, oh God, I am so tired. You gave me this great victory. Don't let me die out here in my thirst and my fatigue. And God, in spite of Samson, in spite of Samson's self-serving, God hears his prayer, opens up a spring, and gives Samson water to drink. And the story pauses there for just a second. And so let's pause with the story. And at this point in the Samson story, what do we see? Well, we see Samson raised up by God to deliver Israel from the Philistines. And Samson is incredibly self-absorbed and self-serving. Samson doesn't even seem to be interested in delivering Israel from the Philistines. He simply seems to be interested in avenging what he perceives as wrongs against himself. And so all his attacks on the Philistines have been driven by self-interest and self-serving. Samson's self-interested. Not only that, Samson's driven by the, what the Apostle John calls in his letter, the lust of the eyes. Whatever looks good to Samson Samson takes, right? He sees a Philistine woman. She's right in his eyes. She looks good to him. So he's going to take her. He wants her. Oh, he goes off to see the, the, you know, and relive the glory moment of killing that lion. And he goes to look at that lion's car. Oh, there's honey. And that honey looks good. So he takes it out of the carcass of a lion, right? Like Samson's driven by whatever feels right, whatever looks good. And Samson is cocky and proud and arrogant and spiteful and vengeful. Samson is not much of a hero. Samson is a self-serving, self-centered, arrogant man. Interestingly enough, unlike in all the other judges in the main section of judges, the story doesn't end there. It says Samson ruled uh, Israel for 20 years, but the story doesn't end. So let's pick up in Judges chapter 16 and get the, the end of the story. It's been maybe 20 years, 15 years. It's been a longer period of time in Samson's rule. We're coming down towards the end of Samson's life. Um, and Judges chapter 16 says, Samson decides, hmm, I should go to Gaza. So he heads to Gaza. We don't know why. Uh, Gaza was just one of the, not just one of the Philistine cities. It was the most important Philistine city. It's 40 miles away from Samson's hometown. 
Um, and Samson heads down to Gaza, 40 miles away. For some unknown reason, he heads there. And when he arrives in Gaza, he sees a prostitute. Um, same song, different verse. Samson sees a woman, and he wants her. A prostitute. And so he hires her. Um, and word begins to spread through the town of Gaza. Guess what? Our arch enemy, Samson, he's here. He's at the prostitute's house. Um, well, somehow Samson realizes they know that he's there, and so they've kind of, s- kind of surrounded the house, and they're, they're going to kind of make an ambush on the house in the morning, and Samson's like, yeah, they can't touch me. And so in the middle of the night, Samson gets up, and he, he leaves the city of Gaza, and he doesn't just leave peacefully. As he's leaving Gaza in his pride and in his arrogance and his self-serving, Uh, Samson goes to the city gates and he rips the city gates off their hinges and puts them on his shoulder and he carries them up the big hill outside of the city that looks towards Hebron. Um, And city gates in the ancient world, we're not talking like a small little gate. Uh, City gates were like the most important like defense for a city wall because it was the vulnerable spot of a wall. It was the one place where an enemy could charge in and you're talking about a big gate where uh, a chariot and carts could come through. Uh, scholars estimate these gates would have weighed four to 500 pounds. And Samson puts those gates on his back. He carries them up a hill, sheds those gates. I'm like, yeah, you can't touch me. You can't stop me. He's proud and loud and arrogant and self-serving. Well, the Philistines have had just about enough of Samson. Um, and there's a woman back in the Sorek Valley um, who Samson, once again, oh, she looks good to Samson. Her name is Delilah. And Samson likes her. Uh, She looks good to him. Um, And the Philistine rulers somehow get word of this. And so they all come together with a plan. They each bring 1,100 pieces of silver, which in modern day terms would be millions of dollars. So they bring millions of dollars to Delilah. This is how bad they want to get rid of Samson. They bring millions of dollars to Delilah, Delilah and say, hey, Would you use your feminine wiles to somehow uh, figure out the source of Samson's strength so that we may subdue him and kill him? So, so, you know, Delilah's like, I'm rich. Sure, I'll do that. And so um, she begins to seduce Samson and entice Samson. And and her, her, her bold little approach is not even subtle. She just goes straight to Samson one night and says, so, Samson, tell me what's the secret of your strength. Like, that's, that's your plan? And she's like, I just want the money, right? So maybe he'll just tell me. And Samson, she asks, Samson says, well, if you, if you tie my hands with fresh bowstrings that haven't been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Um, which, by the way, fresh bowstrings were made out of, um, you know, the sinews of a dead carcass. Um, Never mind. So while he's sleeping, she ties his hands. She says, Philistine, or Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And uh, the Philistines rush upon Samson. He breaks the bowstrings. He conquers the Philistines and destroys them. And it's like, so she tries again. Samson, you've made a fool of me. I thought you loved me. If you just loved me, you would really tell me what makes you so strong. And so Samson says, oh, try, tie me with some fresh ropes that have never been used before, never been dried. I'll become as weak as any other man. And so she, she, she ties him up. Same thing. Samson's asleep. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And once again, he breaks the ropes and he uh, you know, conquers the Philistines, destroys them. And, and so then uh, we don't know how long this is, but at another point, she's like, Samson, you're making me look stupid. You're making a fool of me. Don't you really love me? And she's doing everything she can, and she entices him and seduces him. Samson, Samson, who's so arrogant, so proud, and figures he's so untouchable, Samson flirts dangerously close with the truth. Samson says to her, well, it's my hair. It's my hair. If you just take my hair and you weave it into your your weaving loom, then I'll become as weak as any other man. Now, here's the reality. At this point in Samson's life, he's compromised his vow with alcohol. He's compromised his vow with dead things, but he's never cut his hair. But he figures he's untouchable, and so he flirts with disaster. And so uh, while he's sleeping, Delilah weaves the long locks of Samson's hair into her loom, 
and uh, the Philistines rush upon him and Samson just stands up and he rips the loom right out of the ground and rips his hair out of the loom and he conquers the Philistines and destroys them. Um, and Delilah is just at a loss. She's like, I want this money, and I want to know. And so she's at a loss. And so she just keeps pressuring Samson and pressuring Samson and pressuring Samson and pressuring until finally, finally, Samson is just worn down once again. Um, And Samson, in a moment of weakness, figures he's so untouchable, it's not going to happen anyhow. So he just tells her the truth. Look, look, Delilah, if you actually cut off my hair, I become as weak as every other man. And Delilah could tell that's the truth. That's the truth. And so she, maybe she got Samson drunk. We don't know. She got Samson good and sleepy. And Samson's asleep in her, with his head resting on her lap. And she cuts off the locks of Samson's hair. Um, well, Samson doesn't know that's happened. She says the same thing that she's been saying all these other times. Oh, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And Samson has no idea that his strength has left him because his vow has been completely compromised at this point. The symbol, the visible symbol of his vow was his hair. And God's like, enough is enough. And God withdraws his strength from Samson. So Samson gets up and he thinks he's going to attack the Philistines, but he's as weak as any other man. And the Philistines rush upon him and they capture Samson. They actually gorge out his eyes in a strange and fitting irony because it was Samson's eyes that drove him to disaster. And the Philistines gouge out his eyes and they march him 40 miles all the way back to their most important city, the city of Gaza. Well, while Samson's in Gaza, the text tells us his hair begins to grow. Um, So here's Samson, weak, helpless, in chains, blind, but his hair begins to grow. Uh, And the, the Philistines decide to have a kind of a show of Samson and they're conquering their enemy. And so they actually bring Samson out in chains and they bring him into the temple of one of their main gods, Dagon. Um, and they got 3,000 people in the, the, the assembly and they're all poking fun at Samson and mocking him and they're making Samson look stupid because he's blind and can't see where he's going and they're having great fun at Samson's expense. And after a little while, Samson is tired and they take a break and Samson leans against the two pillars that support the entire temple and he gets an idea. He gets an idea. And Samson in this moment prays. This is the second time we see Samson pray in the text. And just like the last where he prays in a self-serving way, he still prays in a self-serving way. You, you would hope for a moment of redemption, but Samson never learns. And so he prays in this moment, God, one more time would you give me strength that I might avenge my two eyes. And Samson puts his hands on the two pillars that support the temple and he presses with all his might and the, the pillars begin to shake and they Samson presses harder and harder until the pillars just break and crumble and collapse and the entire temple comes crashing down. And Samson and 3,000 Philistines were killed that day in the temple of Dagon in the city of Gaza. And when I look at the Samson story and I look at his tragic end, you know, you, you hope for a hero to have a moment of redemption. And for Samson, there's no moment of redemption. Samson dies just as self-serving, just as self-interested, and just as vengeful and spiteful as he did 20 years earlier. Samson, Samson is a tragic hero who never learns what it really means to fulfill his calling before God. He's compromised his calling with little choice after little choice. I'll just go into the vineyard here. Oh, it won't really matter because I'm really just touching the honey, not the lion. Ooh, she looks good to me. Little compromise, little compromise, little compromise. And Samson, Samson never learns the truth and never fulfills his calling. He compromises his calling all the way to the end. And the contrast between Samson and what the people really need couldn't be clearer, right? Like from the Samson story through the rest of the book of Judges, there's a repeated refrain. In fact, it's the very last line of the book. And that refrain is this, 
There, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. See, the first time we heard that phrase, right in his own eyes, was with Samsa, Samson in Timnah and his first marriage. Um, Samson thought, she was right in my eyes. And then for the rest of the story of Samson, that's what we hear. That's what we hear is Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel. And so everyone, even the leaders, did what was right in their own eyes. Samson is a tragic leader who never learns his lesson. And he does what's right in his own eyes. And the contrast with the true king of Israel couldn't be more striking, right? The part of the covenant with Israel, part of the point of that was that Israel's king was supposed to be God. Uh, but Israel had been so unfaithful to their covenant that God is not even their king anymore. There is no king in the land, and everyone's just doing whatever they feel like, whatever looks good to them. But someday God would send his own true king. God himself would come in the person of Jesus. And the contrast between Samson and Jesus, Israel's two king, is striking. Samson served himself. Jesus served others. Samson showed off his strength. Jesus surrendered his power. Samson dies, avenging his eyes, dies for his own sake. Jesus offers himself for the sake of others. And nowhere really is that contrast between Israel's true king, Jesus, and Samson any more apparent than in the Christmas story, which we celebrate at this time of year, right? Jesus... God in the flesh, born in the backwaters of a Roman Empire. If you're familiar with Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story, right? In those days, Caesar Augustus sends out a decree. Um, Here's Caesar, like Samson, here's Caesar, like Samson, loud and proud and arrogant. I'm going to count my whole territory, figure out all my lands, figure out how many people I rule, and he's imposing his power. He's loud and proud like Samson. But somewhere... In the backwaters of Caesar's empire, a peasant woman and her fiancé are being forced by his decree to travel to a little tiny village, the village of Bethlehem. And in that village, in a peasant home, the true king of Israel and the whole world is born. Lowly, humble, common, ordinary. That, my friends, is the contrast between Samson And Israel's true king, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Israel's true king, he's like the anti-Samson. He's the one who comes humble and lowly of heart among peasant people in in a common, ordinary, humble sort of way. That's Israel's true king. In fact, Paul, the apostle, describes it like this in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, 5 and following, the apostle Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in King Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, meaning something to be used for his own sake, used for his own advantage. That's the idea of grasp there. He didn't use it, uh, his equality with God, as something to be used for his own advantage, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to the lowest form of death, death on a cross. And the reality is, is we tend to like our heroes loud and proud like Samson. I think that's why we know him as the one judge that we actually are familiar with because his exploits are incredible and he's awesome and he's strong and he's great. And we tend to like our heroes like that, loud and proud and taking out the bad guys. But Jesus comes as a common, ordinary, humble person. And he lays down his life for others. And so the Samson story in the context of the biblical story, really presents us with a choice. You have the pattern of Samson, loud, proud, self-serving, and arrogant. And you have Israel's true king, Jesus, lowly, humble, self-sacrificing. Which pattern are you going to choose? 